Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Rita, what? The hospice. Tell me, why the hospice? Don't stress me out. Where should I put Sana? Nervously, almost shouting, but still restraining herself, Anna replied to her friend. She was talking on the phone with her old acquaintance Rita, and this conversation was one of the most difficult in her life. Recently, Rita was diagnosed with the final stage of a rare disease, and she was desperately trying to figure out how her son's life would proceed, either temporarily or even completely without his mother. One of the people involved in Anna's troubles was her classmate and a good friend. Rita's personal life was enviable, her son Leonardo, a handsome husband, a good job. However, not long ago, her husband Tomas had to resign due to serious changes within the company, and for several months now, the woman had to financially support the family on her own. Tomas is looking for a job, she told her friends. His profession is highly competitive. Difficulties, though of different nature, united and brought the women even closer. And when they met in the evening somewhere in a cafe or at each other's homes, one would talk about her health problems, and the other sympathetically shared feelings of worry and exhaustion from work. And now, Rita called her friend with advice to check into a hospice. She saw how Anna was fading away before her eyes and believed that such fading should not be witnessed by her 11-year-old son, Alex. Moreover, as she said, the place had many positive reviews, and some even achieved remission from there. Just call them. Simply give them a call, Rita replied with a quiet, soft voice. Well, what will they tell me? Should I check in or not? I don't know, Rita, I... I'm not ready for this. Anna, what do you mean not ready? No one is asking you to check in there immediately. Find out the conditions, I don't know, at least consider the option. Rita, I'll call, okay. I have tons of things to deal with, we'll talk again. Bye for now. Anna hung up and sat on a kitchen stool. Alex was at school. Maybe, indeed, I should call. What am I really losing? Throughout the day, she still couldn't bring herself to call the hospice. Now, Alex came home from school, Anna made her evening call, but the woman was still contemplating whether she should dial the number her friend had given her. She caught herself thinking that it was difficult for her to admit that she had given up and was ready to depart to the other side. During the night, she struggled with doubts a little more, but upon waking up, she finally decided, no, it's not my time yet. Yet, she saved that phone number in her phone book. A week later, Anna heard the long-awaited voice on the phone. It was David Aguilar, a doctor from the clinic she was attending. He had good news the operation was possible, and there was already a doctor ready to perform it. He asked her to come to the clinic to discuss all the information face-to-face. -face. On the same day, Anna went to David Aguilar's office. Enthused by the good news, she entered the room with a smile and trembling, which barely allowed her to say, Hello, Senor Aguilar. Anna had been waiting for this meeting for a long time and, to be honest, had given up hope that the doctor would call. But this call breathed new life and new hopes into her. And now, as she stood at the threshold, the woman was overwhelmed with positive emotions. Why are you so out of breath? You can barely talk. Hello, my dear, have a seat. The doctor spoke to her, as he did with all his patients, in an extremely gentle and tactful manner. But today he was clearly puzzled by something. Senor Aguilar, I'm ready. Yes, I'm ready as soon as tomorrow. She said. No rush, Anna, there's no need. But, well done for being ready. Sonora Diaz will tell you everything, but that's for later. I want to talk about the payment. David Aguilar smoothly shifted his gaze from the patient to his desk calendar with the clinic symbol. It seemed he was searching for the right words in his mind to deliver some unpleasant information. I've gathered 50,000 euro. Will there be any additional expenses? Anna, that's the thing. Now they're telling me it's not like that. It's 150,000 euro now. How? Anna looked at the embarrassed doctor in horror. She wanted to start a furious speech, but something held her back, and for a minute, she simply sat in silence. 
Then the disappointed patient finally added, I don't have that kind of money, and I won't have it. I'm sorry. Senor Aguilar tried to persuade Anna for some time that there were options and that she wasn't under any pressure. But she just smiled and nodded, already pondering her next steps. The last few days of May. Alex couldn't wait for their completion. Ahead were yard gatherings, football, moped rides. He also wanted to go to his father's country house since he had friends and the most enjoyable activities waiting for him there. Alex had already read half of the literature list that Sonora Benitez, his class teacher, had given. He loved reading, and it seemed he couldn't live without books. Even his mom sometimes marveled at this hobby that had gone out of fashion nowadays and boasted to her friends on every occasion. Oh, you know, my Alex has read this long ago. And now, sitting in his stuffy little room, Alex was engrossed in his latest adventure with Swift's Gulliver, who ended up in the land of Lilliputians. His computer had been idle for a whole week. Alex, come to the table, his mother opened the door to his room. You can continue reading later. For another five minutes, the boy couldn't tear himself away from the captivating book, but eventually, reluctantly, he got up and headed to the kitchen. Mom, what's for dinner? Anything interesting? By the way, your favorite chicken paella. Hooray! The boy perked up and quickly sat down at the table. His mom watched him with a happy smile as he savored her signature chicken paella. The intense midday sun filled the entire kitchen and the two of them basked in its rays. Anna felt a catharsis, a sense of complete happiness, where she needed no one else but the little person sitting in front of her. But her severe illness marred this beautiful scene. The boy knew about her condition almost everything, and he always asked his mother not to hide anything she was honest with him. But there was one thing that Alex didn't know, his mother was planning to go to a hospice. She was just about to tell him about her decision. So, how do you like it, Alex? Very much. The satisfied and contented boy smiled. Do you want some more? Yes, I'll help myself. Alex headed to the stove and added a bit more paella to his plate. In general, the boy tried to help his mother with household chores. He often went to the store to buy groceries, and sometimes he even attempted cooking. There were days when Anna simply lay in bed, weakened by pain in her joints and dizziness. That's when her son took care of all the everyday tasks. Alex had long been accustomed to being a reliable support for his mother. Alex, I need to talk to you, the mother said hesitantly. Alex immediately understood that it would be about her health, and his previously cheerful face darkened. Sash, Anna continued, I'm going to a hospice. It's necessary. At least for now. Alex didn't respond, abruptly getting up from the table. Within a second, he found himself in his room, and five minutes later, he was out on the street. What's gotten into him? Anna said aloud, left alone within the four walls. Sitting in the kitchen, she pressed her fists against her face and gazed absently at the floor. What was she supposed to do? That amount had been raised with so much effort and, most importantly, humiliations. She didn't want to humiliate herself even more by trying to gather the other thousands from people who were not wealthy at all. It wasn't easy for the woman to cook the delicious paella for her son and she felt and understood that the ground was slowly slipping from under her feet. Soon, she would be extremely incapacitated. Did she want her son to witness that? On the other hand, she really didn't want to leave her son. Yes, she wasn't planning to leave him alone, but a trip to her mother's village, 500 kilometers away from home, wasn't the best option for the boy. Even though Anna's mother was still relatively young, she didn't want to burden her. Thoughts for and against the hospice were swirling chaotically in her head, and poor Anna couldn't find peace, but she had to make a decision. Did she just say, like, I'm going to a hospice? Alex and Victor were sitting on the benches of an open stadium, as usual, sharing their life stories. This time, Alex was talking more, which was unusual in their daily conversations. Vico silently listened to the boys' confessions and only occasionally interjected. Wow, that's tough. Freaking insane. 
but in the middle of their conversation, something clicked in Victor's mind. He suddenly interrupted his friend. Hey, wait a second. You know, you can sell those old books of yours for a good price. You mentioned it once, remember? Like, there's this Dutch book your grandpa gave you. Oh, right. There's one and a couple more. Alex pondered. What should I tell grandpa? Haha, -ha, he probably forgot about it already. Victor burst into laughter. Hey, a displeased man's voice came from a distance. Go home. Everything's closed here. One of the stadium guards scolded them. The boy said goodbye, and Vico headed home, while Alex stood there for a couple more minutes before deciding to go home since his mother wasn't feeling well. For the rest of the evening and throughout the night, Alex couldn't fall asleep. He kept thinking about what to do with his books. It was already 3 a.m. when he quietly got out of bed, turned on the computer, and began searching for information on book sales. After about an hour of browsing the internet, he finally found an event where they would be selling antiques. The event was scheduled to take place in three days. Alex firmly decided, I'll go and see what happens. The next morning, Alex was in a good and cheerful mood, and he infected his mother with his lifted spirits. The two of them sat peacefully in the kitchen, sipping coffee and eating pancakes. Grandma called, asking about your studies. And also, Aunt Rita called, Anna began the conversation with her son. She calls quite often. Hasn't she annoyed you yet? Alex grinned. Anna never understood why the Farrer family didn't particularly appeal to her son. He always reluctantly agreed to spend time with them and occasionally made sarcastic remarks about them. Aunt Rita, in particular, bothered him. Alex couldn't even explain why he felt repelled by them. Alex, what are you saying? Rita helps me. With her empty talk, maybe? Well, at least Dad sends us money. That's what he should do, Alex. But yes, Dad is great. He wants you to buy yourself a new iPhone, the latest model. He says he'll decide when he sees your grades. Oh, then I won't get an iPhone. Mother and son laughed. They spent another half an hour in the kitchen, periodically refilling their coffee cups and discussing everyday matters, school, basketball practice, internet bills, the new neighbor on the fifth floor. The long morning conversation was interrupted by a call on Anna's phone. Son, go out and enjoy your weekend, she said. She saw Rita on the screen and knew another long and unpleasant conversation was waiting for her. Anna didn't want to involve Alex in this again. As always, Rita was interested in her friend's situation. She questioned her in detail about the conversation with Senor Aguilar and her decision to go to a hospice. Anna had shared about her job and another unsuccessful interview with Tomas, firmly believing that her husband was, as she often put it, a brilliant IT specialist. Finally, Rita got to the important topic she called for. I want to ask about Alex. Have you decided where he'll stay while you're away? Alex will go to his grandmother. It's all been decided a long time ago, Anna shared. Rita paused briefly, seemingly contemplating her response, and then started. And, do you really think it's a good idea for him to be in the village? What are the conditions like there? No, no, and you shouldn't send him there. I won't give him to my husband, that's out of the question, he has his own family, and Alex is not needed there. He pays the money, and that's it. Ah, uh, I see. And, why are you so set on this? Maybe things will be better for you, and you're sending the boy off to live in the middle of nowhere. It's not a village, Rita, it's a town-type settlement. My mom hasn't even turned 60 yet, and she's willing to take him. Everything is fine there, you don't even know the situation. Anna got upset, and her tone shifted from calm to irritated. And, come on, and, sorry, my dear. Rita hurried to calm her friend. I worry about you and Alex. Leo also asks about him. Tomas is interested. We're not strangers, you know. I understand, Rita, thank you. We, as a family, thought about it and so. Maybe Alex could stay with us for a while? It's not a problem for us. 
Rita, no, come on, what are you talking about? You have a big family. Besides, what will Tomas say? He's studying in a good school, goes to basketball practice, has friends here. Do you want to deprive him of all that? And the money for renting the apartment will cover him. And as for Tomas, what about him? You know, I decide, and he goes along with it. It sounds a bit too imposing, Rita, Anna pondered. She couldn't say then that she didn't like the decision. She just didn't want to burden her friend. A few days before Anna's admission to Wings of Hope, the hospice on the outskirts of the city founded by the deputy and philanthropist Sonora Montero, the Ferrer family took in an 11-year-old boy named Alex. He had recently come to terms with the fact that his mother would be under the care of nurses and doctors somewhere far away from home. But Alex hadn't lost hope of helping his mother. He firmly decided to sell his most valuable books and eagerly awaited the event. The day had come. School was almost over, and with free time after classes and phone calls from his mother asking him to come home early, Alex had the liberty to wander around for as long as he pleased. Today, at 8 in the evening, he was supposed to head to the antique sale. To his surprise, Rita, who was usually overly concerned, didn't even flinch when he informed her of his plan just five minutes before leaving the house. She simply said, We'll have dinner in an hour, but don't worry, I'll warm it up for you. The event was lively and bustling with many antique enthusiasts and sellers gathered there. They had a variety of items, including china from imperial times, musical instruments, and costume jewelry. There weren't many books, which was definitely advantageous for Alex. Visitors often approached him, but after asking a few questions, for some reason, they lost interest and moved on in search of the next curio. Alex was sadly waiting for someone, anyone, who would show interest in his books. Meanwhile, the clock was approaching 10 in the evening, which meant that the event was coming to an end. Why did I listen to Victor? He said some nonsense. Who needs my books anyway? Alex thought dejectedly. He was looking at the covers of his books when suddenly he heard a voice nearby. Oh, what do I see? Vandel. The Golden Age of Dutch Literature. Alex looked up. Before him stood a middle-aged man of about 60, examining his books. His neatly combed gray hair swept back, slightly curled mustache, and blue eyes filled with some mysterious sadness revealed an extraordinary personality. His expensive stylish attire, a beige linen suit with cufflinks on his shirt, suggested that he was not a poor man. He leaned on a cane and seemed frail, but the zest for life hadn't left him. And now, he was very interested in the books and their young seller. Alex gathered his courage and asked, Are you interested in something here? Honestly, young man? I might consider taking this Dutch companion. And for how much? How much do you want for it? The man in beige chuckled good-naturedly. I don't know. Well, haven't you considered this question? You need to find out how much your goods can be worth before anything else. Yeah, I didn't think about it. The boy was puzzled. Yes, young man, I am not a bookseller, but this item here could be worth 10000 The boy's spirits lifted momentarily, but the mention of 10000 brought him back down to earth, and the man could see the disappointment in his face. You know, young man, good money nowadays, I think. Don't you agree? Alex sadly looked down at the floor and didn't respond. The man, from his experience, understood that the boy was in trouble and unintentionally offered. Let's discuss your books, young man. You need to know the edition, publication year, all those things, otherwise, you might be deceived. I can give you a couple of valuable tips. What's your name, young man? Alex. I'm Salvador Hernandez. And I suggest we go to the coffee shop and discuss these important matters. Oh, no, you know, I probably need to go home. Alex had often heard his mother talk about how dangerous unfamiliar adults could be. If it weren't for his current situation, he would have hurriedly left without saying a word to the man. A taxi will take you home, don't worry. I'm not a bandit. The man's friendliness and persistence stunned the boy, and he reluctantly agreed to the man with the cane. 
They sat and discussed books over a cup of coffee. Don Hernandez gave Alex valuable information about buying and selling books. It was all interesting to the boy, but he kept thinking about his mother and couldn't understand why he was there, silently asking himself, what am I doing here? His new acquaintance had long noticed Alex's worries and asked in passing, Alex, what are you saving up for? Sorry if I'm prying. I wanted to help my mom. Is she in trouble? She's in the hospice. They canceled the operation for some reason. I think it's because of money, but they won't tell me. And you don't know how much the operation costs? I looked it up online, more than 200000 for sure. I'm a fool, I hope to sell these books for money. My friend and I were talking, sitting there, and he suggested this idea. Yes, Alex, your friend, like you, didn't consider that you need to know the value of the books, at least approximately. You need to thoroughly understand everything first, my friend, before thinking about money. That's a principle you need to follow in any business. You're right, Alex responded thoughtfully. The man hesitated for a long time, twirling the ends of his gray mustache. Then he turned to Alex. Are you afraid to work? Work? If I need to, Alex didn't understand where Don Hernandez was going with this. I have a house outside the city. I need someone to take care of the garden and feed my hairless. Hairless? Well, it's a breed called SPHYNX. Wow, 11 already. I'll order a taxi for you, and you can think about my offer. I'll pay generously. With these words, the man placed a 200 euro note on the table and took out a card with his phone number from his pocket. Just a few minutes before midnight, Alex opened the door to his new home. Aunt Rita was displeased with his late return, but she tried to hide her annoyance. Quietly reheating some food for Alex, she went to her husband's bedroom. Alex lived and slept in the living room, accepting all the inconveniences that came with it, understanding that he was only a temporary guest at Rita's place. Lying in bed, he took out his smartphone, illuminated the screen with the card he received at the cafe, business consultant Salvador of Hernandez Carrasco. On the back, it said, founder of Pearl, Dream House, and Seventh Heaven. He couldn't sleep for a long time pondering whether he should get involved with this mysterious man who showed interest in his plight. Saturday morning started in the Ferrer family with a delicious breakfast and casual conversation. Alex silently observed the happy interaction between mother, father, and son. Tomas was talking to his wife about an upcoming job interview, while Rita was caressing Leo's head and occasionally getting distracted from her husband's engaging story, urging her child. Come on, Leo, eat some more. Alex felt a little sad watching this scene, which he believed would never be a part of his life. Furthermore, he felt like an outsider in this household. He noticed how Tomas, the head of the family, looked at him disapprovingly from time to time. Soon, Father and Leo left for a football game, leaving Alex alone with Aunt Rita. She came to the living room, where Alex was lying on the couch, engrossed in his phone, and sat on the edge. She began the conversation. You came home very late yesterday. My family had already gone to bed. I'm sorry, Aunt Rita. I'll come back earlier next time, Alex replied apologetically. In fact, Alex, you can leave if you want to. If you have friends or acquaintances, you don't have to stay overnight every time. You know, you're a grown-up young man now almost 12 years old. You don't need to be with little Leo all the time. Just make sure to answer my call so I know where you are and with whom. I worry, and so does your mom. But let's not tell your mom about our arrangement, okay? She wanted to have complete control, but I see that you're bored with us. Okay, sure, we're agreed, the boy responded nonchalantly. He showed almost no concern or surprise and didn't take Rita's words as anything negative. On the contrary, he was relieved that he no longer had to be dependent on this unfamiliar company. In two weeks, Anna managed to settle in Wings of Hope and make new friends. She liked this place. There was a beautiful garden, many interesting activities, and places for solitude, which was especially pleasant for the sick. Her ex-husband, Anton, paid for Anna's stay in the hospice. 
Now, he was sending money to Alex through Rita. Despite the distance, Anna was grateful to him for all the help. After all, he once left her for his young secretary, breaking her heart, even though she loved him very much. But now, warm feelings for him were returning to her. And though her health was failing, she felt harmony in her soul. Only worry for her son did not let her breathe freely. Lately, when he visited her, Alex seemed closed and hiding something. The only person who could dispel all these doubts for Anna was her friend Rita, who took the boy under her wing. One beautiful summer morning, Rita called her. Rita, hi. How's everything over there? Anna, sunshine, hi, dear. Everything is great with us. It's all super. Alex is very happy here with us. Anna, tell me about yourself. What's it like in the new place? Rita, well, you know, we need to know all about Alex first. What's he doing? Is he hanging out with his friends until late? Anna, your Alex is wonderful. You can ask him about everything yourself. I can. But you're a woman, a mother. You know these men, you have to pull everything out of them. Her friend said softly, Anna, everything is fine with him. Did his father send you money on the iPhone? Yes, Anna, he did. But we decided with Alex to wait for the new one to come out. It's about to be released. Are you okay with that? Anna agreed and chatted with her friend for a few more minutes, telling her about her new concerns. After hanging up, she still felt uneasy. Her motherly heart sensed that something was wrong. In the phone conversation with her friend, she felt that Rita was hiding something and didn't want to share news like she used to. There was no sense of openness that was always present in their conversations as women. Why was Rita deflecting her questions? Surely, as a mother herself, she must understand that the most important thing in Anna's situation is to know about her son's life. Perhaps, Rita was burdened by Alex's presence in her apartment? Maybe Tomas wasn't happy about it? In any case, Anna realized that her worry for her son would wait for her until they were together again, and hoped that the situation with the operation would somehow be resolved and David Aguilar would call again, lived in her heart. Two days later, Alex called Don Hernandez and accepted his offer. And a week later, he went to visit him outside the city. It was a magnificent three-story house, similar to those shown on television in movies about millionaires. There was a pool, a garden, and even a small mini golf course. All the plants were neatly trimmed, and the house and gazebo were in perfect order. There was nothing unnecessary on the property. It was a kingdom of minimalism. The furniture, decorative stones, fence, and other elements of the landscape design stood out with their strict forms, moderate quantity, and subdued natural colors. The boy appreciated his new friends dwelling from the first steps on the property. It's very beautiful, but I'm afraid to do anything here. What if I mess something up with my work? Don Hernandez burst into his usual good-natured laughter. You'll have a teacher. A teacher? The boy was surprised. Yes, I'll introduce you to him later. But for now, let's go to the gazebo. Teresa will pour us some coffee. As the two approached the gazebo, Alex noticed Don Hernandez's gait. He still leaned on the same cane that he had at the sale, and he was clearly limping. Sitting in the gazebo, Alex admired the views of the businessman's property. He never thought he would end up in such a magical place. Don Hernandez, always attentive to human emotions, noticed the enchanted gaze of his young guest. Impressed? Now, your job is to make all my guests as impressed as you are now, the man smiled. It's a big responsibility, Alex pondered. Of course, Alex, responsibility. And find one activity in this world where there's no responsibility needed. We're responsible for everything and everyone. The man paused and sadly surveyed his landscapes. So, don't be afraid to take responsibility for my trees, shrubs, flowers. If I appointed you to this task, it means I believe in you, you understand. Just like in business. I understand, the boy replied, not taking his eyes off the beauty of the property. But, well, Alex, don't worry, 
Uncle Luca will help you with everything. Who is Uncle Luca? I'll introduce you, the man said contentedly, taking a sip of slightly cooled strong tea. That same evening, Alex met the gardener, Luca, who immediately briefed him on what needed to be trimmed, where to pull out weeds, how to clean the pools, and how to care for the flowers. He led the boy around the huge property and quickly jumped from one topic to another. So much so that at the end of the conversation, Alex wondered if he could remember it all. And most importantly, whether he could do it exactly as the gardener told him. Definitely, the end of the day was full of impressions for the boy. He learned how to prune trees and shrubs, discovered new types of plants, tended to the lawn. And most importantly, Alex received his first ever salary, a whole 500 euro. Now he calculated in his mind how much he could earn in a month. At the end of the day, Salvador Hernandez shared business wisdom with Alex, explaining how he could earn a percentage of the money earned. The boy was delighted with such a useful and pleasant acquaintance, but still couldn't understand why someone as wealthy as Salvador needed the help of an ordinary 11-year-old boy, especially with personal problems. Impressed by the extraordinary day, Alex completely forgot about the agreement with Aunt Rita. She had asked him not to come home late, and his smartphone clock already showed 10 p.m. He was riding in a business class taxi, looking at the still not dark June sky. Alex realized that he would soon have to face another conversation with the displeased friend of his mother. The boy tried to enter the corridor very carefully. He quietly turned on the light and began to take off his shoes. The apartment was dark. Apparently, all the family members were asleep. Alex headed to the living room. He was about to undress and go to bed when Tomas, the head of the family, came out of the bedroom. The robust, slightly balding man, almost two meters tall, with a stern face, was wearing a robe. He looked at Alex with undisguised disdain and said sternly, Boy, what did Aunt Rita tell you? Not to come here late. Don't you have anywhere else to spend the night? Frightened, Alex wanted to respond to the man, but only Rita, who had just woken up, hurried out of the bedroom. Tomas, Tomas, what's gotten into you? The woman patted her husband on the shoulder. Alex, everything's fine, don't worry. Tomas, what's gotten into you, really? I wouldn't have gotten up if it weren't for him, the man replied gloomily. I'm going to have some water. He approached the kitchen table, poured himself some water from the filter jug, took a couple of sips, and stared at the boy with a dissatisfied look, wanting to continue his speech. Tomas, go to bed, Rita said in an almost commanding, yet still gentle tone. The man obeyed and left. Rita looked perplexedly at the boy. Alex, he's going through a hard time, you understand? He's looking for work, and you upset him, he said something stupid because of stress. Come to us anytime, we worry about you. I'll talk to Uncle Tomas. Alex didn't say anything. As soon as he was left alone in the living room, he, having pondered his decision, wearily collapsed onto the bed and pulled the blanket over himself. The boy fell asleep almost immediately. It was his first night after a workday. On the morning, Alex packed all his belongings into a small backpack and left. On the very first day of their acquaintance, Don Hernandez inquired more about Alex's housing situation and offered him to stay overnight in one of the rooms of his three-story mansion, so he wouldn't have to take a taxi in the middle of the night and feel like an outsider in someone else's family. Alex, of course, declined. He couldn't agree to such splendid conditions due to his ingrained politeness and modesty. Both his mom and dad had taught him about kindness and empathy. And they had also taught him not to be pushy or impose himself on others. But why did such good and righteous parents part ways, huh? Alex still didn't understand. Or maybe they themselves didn't understand him. But that nighttime encounter with Uncle Tomas had hurt the boy deeply, as self-respect was not a foreign quality to him. Have you thought it through, Alex? Have you warned everyone? asked the joyful businessman, meeting him at the gates. Don Hernandez was extremely pleased that now he could have someone to talk to in his luxurious but very lonely kingdom besides his gardener Luca. Though he understood that not every parent would be happy about such an acquaintance for their child. 
Yes, Don Hernandez, I have thought about it. And did you call your mom and tell her? Of course. And what did she say? Oh, nothing much. She just told me to call and text. She said, don't worry, we care about you. It was easier for Alex to lie, using Aunt Rita's words from the previous day as a basis. This way, he didn't feel like he was being dishonest with Don Hernandez. So now, every day, the boy lived and worked at Hernandez's estate. Don Hernandez would return from work only around 10 o'clock, but Alex was still awake at that time. After arriving from work, Don Hernandez often looked pale and exhausted. Being in charge of a large business, not everything went smoothly for him. Employees often betrayed the director, and some matters had to be dealt with personally, without intermediaries. However, the free time at the countryside house, surrounded by a pine forest, was a kind of respite for the high-ranking executive. Now there were two of them, he and Alex. They had dinner together, drank coffee, discussed work plans, Alex's studies, and Don Hernandez's business. But the most frequently discussed topics were, of course, books. The old businessman was often amazed at the Leonardo of Alex's erudition. He heard about certain works for the first time. Have you read Eric Maria Remark? Isn't it too early for you? Hernandez was surprised one day. But Alex's response surprised him even more. I read everything. It's still beneficial for broad. Uh, erudition. The man was increasingly amazed by the boy's intellect and soul. Their communication gradually turned into a friendship. Rita sometimes gazed thoughtfully out the yard window where her seven-year-old son, Leonardo, was playing with his friends, and she wondered about Alex. Even though Anna's son reassured her every day, her heart was still troubled. But it wasn't so much about worrying for someone else's child as it was her conscience not allowing her to live at ease. She struggled within herself, torn between two inner voices. One said, You're doing everything right. You're helping Anna. The boy is grown up. He doesn't need your constant care. You're assisting your friend, so you can do what you need in return. The other persistently insisted, You can't do that. It's wrong. Sometimes, Rita even quietly cried in the kitchen so that Tomas and Leonardo wouldn't hear. But it was more of a momentary weakness, nothing more. Rita was one of those women who loved their family so much that sometimes they forgot that there was a society, a world where other people, children, animals, and plants existed. Rita never thought deeper and sometimes didn't notice that her actions might hurt or discomfort others. Her principle was simple, she would do anything for her family, no matter the cost. She often said these words to colleagues, friends, and acquaintances. For some, such words even sounded a bit threatening, but that was just Rita. It was the fifth day of Alex's stay at the Hernandez's house. Tomas had become kinder and sometimes didn't hesitate to share his joy about the unwanted guest's absence in the apartment. It's good. It's good when there are no stranger's kids around. One day, lying on the couch, the head of the family sighed. But mom said that Alex isn't a stranger, clever Leonardo immediately responded. The boy was playing video games, but, as always, he heard all the conversations between his parents. Tomas looked at Rita, who sadly turned her gaze away. An uncomfortable silence lasted for a minute, but was interrupted by Leonardo's cry of frustration he couldn't pass his challenging mission again. Another day of work for Alex at the businessman's estate was coming to an end. It was the longest day of summer, and it was a weekend. Don Hernandez had invited many friends from the business world. They were having fun, discussing important matters, eating to their heart's content, and drinking expensive wine. Several people noticed the boy sitting in the gazebo, reading an old, tattered book. It was one of Don Hernandez's books. He allowed Alex to take any literature he liked. Who is this young man, Salvador? inquired a well-dressed, dark-haired woman in high heels. He's my worker, now helping Uncle Luca. But he's just a boy. The lady exclaimed with surprise. Are you exploiting child labor? Oh no, come on. His dad, my close acquaintance, asked for a favor. 
He said, let the kid stay with you and help out, and you can pay him. He read all those smart books about how to develop a child's entrepreneurship and thrift from a young age. Don Hernandez felt his face getting warmer with every word he spoke, knowing he was lying, and stopped. He despised dishonesty. People are strange, Salvador. The woman said, even more astonished. The pleasant evening of gatherings came to an end, and, as had become routine, Hernandez sat at the gazebo table, waiting for Alex. He arrived on time, and the man didn't have to wait long. Alex wanted to talk to his friend about his mother's surgery. Alex, something seems to be bothering you today, Hernandez said to the boy. Yes, Don Hernandez. The surgery. It needs to be done soon. Can you tell me more about how to earn more money? About interest rates, banks. Alex, Hernandez looked at the boy, feeling embarrassed. I wanted to talk to you about that. You see, hold on to your money for now. Think about what you'd like to buy yourself. What do you mean? Alex looked directly into Don Hernandez's eyes with confusion. Why am I doing all this? I thought you knew and understood. Yes, I know, Alex, I know. Your mother had the surgery yesterday, everything went well, but she's still weak, of course. That's what Senor Aguilar told me. Don't call her yet, let her recover. Alex rolled his eyes at Hernandez. How? How do you know my mom's doctor? It's called Connections, the old man smiled, looking at Alex with a fatherly fondness. I'm not Uncle Luca, kid. I'm quite an influential gentleman. For the next ten minutes, Alex kept apologizing to his friend, calling him a magician, the best businessman on earth. They laughed, joked, and at the end of the conversation, Alex even hugged Salvador. It was as if he sensed something familiar and long forgotten in the man, and it even brought a tear to his eyes. But of course, Salvador quickly wiped it away, so Alex wouldn't notice. Why should the boy care about someone else's feelings when, at 11 years old, when he had experienced so much of his own? Alex called Aunt Rita and told her about the amazing news. She was stunned and bombarded him with questions about how, who, and when. The decision was made Alex was going to Ferris today. Don Hernandez was a bit moody in the morning, even though he understood that the boy needed to see the people who took him in. And more and more, he felt uncertain, what if Alex had lied and his mother didn't know about his new life? Still, he almost didn't want to let go of this little but already serious person who had found a place in his heart. He became almost like family to the old man. After a dry farewell to the excited Alex, Don Hernandez let him go. Once again, sitting in a business class taxi, the child now noticed and felt its superiority. Before that, his thoughts were filled only with the most important things, the perfect leather interior, air conditioning, and even a bottle of still water in case the passenger felt thirsty. And the driver was someone else, not the usual one. His appearance and exceptional politeness made Alex feel like an esteemed guest, someone like Don Hernandez. Although Alex had also noticeably succeeded. During all his days working for the businessman, he had earned a substantial amount, 6,000 euro. Alex promised Hernandez that he would resume working for him in three days, agreeing to come only twice a week. Alex felt uncomfortable refusing this offer, even though there was no real motivation to visit the lonely man with a cane. However, he had done for him what even his own father couldn't. At the Ferrer's house, it was a rare evening when no one was asleep at 11 at night. Even Leo couldn't be put to bed. He listened to his mom, then dad, then Alex. And though he didn't understand everything, the main thing the child grasped was that Aunt Anna was getting better. Rita was in light bewilderment all the time during the conversation, and Alex mostly interacted with Uncle Tomas. His wife seemed to be somewhere in her thoughts. Alex, who paid for the surgery? Aunt Rita asked thoughtfully. My mom said they don't have enough money. The amount is unaffordable. Alex didn't want to tell Rita anything about Don Hernandez. He felt some kind of threat in the Ferrers finding out about his acquaintance with the old businessman. 
All this time, he had deceived Aunt Rita, making up stories about friends from school inviting him for a sleepover or a good friend of his mother. Rita felt that he wasn't being honest with her, but she didn't want to know the truth. It was easier for her to believe Alex. She had more important things on her mind, Leo's schooling, apartment repairs, and her husband's unemployment. But now, after learning that the complex and expensive surgery was successfully completed, she became more interested in spending time with the boy. I don't know, Aunt Rita. The main thing is that the surgery went well, Alex smiled. Soon, Alex visited his mother in the hospital. They had a warm conversation, and she told him about a strange event. Alex realized that she knew nothing about Don Hernandez. He was glad about that and chose to keep his secret. The Ferrer family was planning a vacation at their summer house, and Rita talked to her husband about taking Alex with them. Tomas didn't mind. He understood that the boy's frequent presence in their lives would soon come to an end. Besides, he wanted Alex to help him with building the fence. Alex didn't refuse for a long time and soon gave Aunt Rita a positive answer. Now, for the most part, it didn't matter to him where to go and what to do. After all, soon his mother would be back home, and that meant life would go on as usual. Having arrived at the Ferrer's summer house, Alex almost immediately started helping Uncle Tomas with the fence. And in his free time, they went to the lake with Leonardo, swimming and relaxing. They even temporarily lent Alex their bike, and he rode it every morning and evening, enjoying the local nature. So a week passed. One day, Alex was very tired. The whole day he was busy first fixing the fence with Uncle Tomas, then helping Aunt Rita with the garden. At 8 in the evening, after the garden work, Aunt Rita said to Alex, Sash, we've worn you out completely. Go, my sunshine, and rest. And Alex went to the small, but cozy room assigned to him with a big bed and a TV. He flipped through all the cable channels, but found nothing to his liking. He then reached into his backpack placed at the foot of the bed. That's right, I brought something with me. Alex recalled. He felt a solid book cover, took it out, and read, Just Tell Van Del Vanden. For the first time in a week, Alex remembered Don Hernandez. God, I was supposed to be at his place on Wednesday. And today? Alex exclaimed. Alex lay back on the soft pillow and felt sad. But the tiredness of the day and the fresh air, which was a rare thing in Alex's life, took over, and within five minutes, the boy peacefully fell asleep without even undressing and covering himself with a blanket. The next morning, Alex quickly packed all his things and found Aunt Rita on the veranda, saying, Aunt Rita, thank you so much for the vacation, but I need to go. Why such a rush? The sleepy hostess asked. I promised a friend to go somewhere today, Alex replied. You are always so mysterious. Who is this friend? Aunt Rita inquired. Alex tried not to show his irritation, but an annoyed grimace appeared involuntarily on his face. Aunt Rita, you yourself said that you don't want to control me. All right, Alex, go then. Have you checked the bus schedule? She asked. I'm taking a taxi, Alex replied. Rita gave Alex a suspicious and unfriendly look and couldn't help but think. Where does this brag get the money from? It was hard for him to go to Hernandez. The man who helped him in a time of great need asked for nothing in return except occasional visits. On the other hand, the person who paid him well for working in the garden and taking care of the cat deserved respectful treatment, not contempt. Alex's conscience troubled him. Nevertheless, he understood that if he didn't visit Hernandez now, he shouldn't come to him in the future either. Sitting at the public transport stop and observing the bustling people, he tried to make the right decision, reviewing all the events and circumstances that happened to him in the past month. Heavy rain was pouring down, and it was overcast and damp. The situation was not conducive to a trip out of town, especially since the boy had soaked through all his clothes and his summer sneakers. Nevertheless, Alex made up his mind. He called a taxi and headed to Don Hernandez's country estate. He warmed up in the car's cabin, trying to find the right words. It was so difficult to find them. 
Even his well-read nature couldn't help express what he had in his heart so that his friend would understand. He reassured himself that he simply wanted to talk and apologize. He convinced himself that his experienced and wise friend would understand everything anyway. Alex didn't plan to stay overnight. He had the keys to the Ferrer's apartment. Uncle Luca opened the gate, holding an umbrella. The incessant downpour had left large puddles on the estate, and the two squeezed under the same umbrella as they made their way to the mansion's porch, hopping over waterlogged areas. Don Hernandez hasn't come home from work yet. He'll be back in about two hours. Let's go. Teresa has already prepared something, Uncle Lucas said, leading the boy to the kitchen. Throughout the time Alex waited for Hernandez, he was extremely anxious about how his friend would receive him and feared a negative reaction to his sudden arrival. A couple of hours later, as Uncle Luca had said, Hernandez arrived. It was evident that work still held him in its grip. He was talking excitedly and disapprovingly through wireless earphones to someone he was supervising. When Alex saw the host of the mansion stop from a distance, he got scared. Was he talking to himself? Wireless earphones were a novelty for simple, not wealthy people, and Alex had only seen them in commercials. Uncle Luca noticed his bewildered expression and laughed, patting him on the shoulder. Alex, don't assume anything bad about Don Hernandez, he's fine. He's using wireless communication, he explained. Don Hernandez finished his unpleasant business call and approached the porch, saying, Oh, who do we have here? Well, hello, Alex. Alex took a deep breath and composed his thoughts before replying. Don Hernandez, hello. I apologize, I am at fault for not coming. He wanted to say more, but Hernandez interrupted him, looking straight into his eyes with a stern voice. Ah, Alex, that's how it should always be in life. Responsibility. We talked about responsibility. You should have come when you were supposed to. What are you doing here now? Go home, Alex. There's nothing for you to do here. Hernandez retreated into the house, and Alex, raising his eyebrows in confusion, stood on the porch and seemed on the verge of tears. To comfort him, the gardener Luca, who had overheard the conversation from nearby, hurriedly said, Don't be upset, Alex. Have a seat. On the porch stood a magazine table made of white marble with three white chairs around it. Uncle Luca and Alex sat on the chairs, and the gardener continued, Alex, I can see that you're worried. I want to tell you a bit about him. But you know how to keep secrets, right? Yes, Alex replied, looking down at the floor, feeling sad. You see, in the 90s, he was part of an organized crime group, a big-time thief. He did a lot of things, of course. I was sort of on the run. Now, I'm a gardener. I've seen a lot, Alex, and he can't find his place in this world anymore. He lost so many loved ones, so many just walked away from him, they ran away, Alex. Alex became more and more curious, and there was no trace of offense or sadness on his face now. He felt like he was learning about his wealthy companion anew. He's really lonely, you know. Uncle Luca emphasized the word lonely. He said it with such pain in his voice that it was evident he himself was involved in some of the things that had happened in the life of the old businessman. He's happy with any genuine, heartfelt communication. And you have a problem too. Do you know how he helps people? He recently got the daughter of a janitor a place in a university in the capital. But it's not just a favors, no. He realized that the girl was smart and very responsible, and he vouched for her. She was all teary-eyed, cleaning the windows. He asked her why she was crying. Uncle Luca fell silent. He looked at the boy, who was stunned by the gardener's words. Alex had learned so much extraordinary and heavy information about the now not-so-mysterious businessman, but rather an ordinary person with his weaknesses, sins, and skeletons in the closet. Somehow, Alex felt very sorry for Hernandez. And also, Alex, he's not well. He's weakened a lot over the years, that's why he moved to the mansion, the air here is good. Yes, it is, Alex replied thoughtfully. Alex stayed on the porch a little longer and decided to leave. 
there was no point in imposing himself on someone he had hurt. Upon returning, he went to the Ferrer's apartment and spent the night there. The next morning, without waiting for Aunt Rita and her family to arrive, he went to visit his mother. Anna looked much fresher and more cheerful than the last time her son had visited. Alex noticed this and thought it was necessary to compliment his mother. Mom, you look good, just great. Alex, I'm not very pleased with you. You look so worn out and pensive, Anna replied, not very happy. No, everything's fine. Come clean with me. How are you with Aunt Rita and Uncle Tomas? I'm lying here, not knowing anything about you. Aunt Rita and Uncle Tomas helped us a lot, Mom. Do you suspect them of something? Anna didn't want to talk about her anxious thoughts that constantly haunted her during her son's absence. She decided, why would I pour all this out to Alex? No. Stay silent, Calvo. So, how about that new iPhone? Is it out yet? She asked, trying to change the subject. Alex looked questioningly at his mom. What do you mean? Well, Aunt Rita told me that you're waiting for a new iPhone. Ah, uh, yes, right. I want a new iPhone. Last one is not so handy. Yes, we're waiting for it. 11-year-old Alex Ortega was clever. It wasn't in vain that he often read books, preferring them to shooters and aimless scrolling through social media. After all, books offered everything, wisdom, resourcefulness, kindness. A reading child goes through so many adventures and can even make new friends and acquaintances much more charismatic and interesting than those at school or in the yard. From Don Quixote, he learned the art of dreaming, and from Dubrovsky, he learned courage and pride. Fearless, cunning D'Artagnan, diligent and persistent Martin Eden, all these characters made Alex who he was now. And now, he realized that there was no need to cause a rift between his mom and Aunt Rita because everything bad was already in the past. Alex had noticed that his life with the Ferrers brought not only inconvenience, but also benefits. Rita saw that the child wasn't particularly demanding and sometimes used the money meant for him. Well, Alex, it's understandable. I'll recover and get a good position in an office. Dennis Nikolievic called me. He was interested. Mom, just don't rush. Aunt Rita said the same. First, you should rest well. Anna shared with her son that her discharge was expected in a week. This news was the most pleasant in a long time. Alex returned to the Ferrers, and Aunt Rita continued to look at him with disapproval, suppressing her unhealthy curiosity and irritation towards the boy. She wanted to know the truth at all costs, where Alex went, who gave him money, what he was up to. Various thoughts crossed her mind. The next day, Alex left again. Rita came home from work early. Tired, she sat on a stool in the corridor and began to take off her shoes. Tomas entered the hallway. Do you know that our handsome boy has run off again? Tomas, just relax. In a week, Anna will be back home, and Alex is just spending his last few days with us. Rita tried to appear indifferent. But Tomas also noticed the strange behavior of Alex and wanted to discuss it with Rita. See, do you notice at all? Do you see him riding in a taxi? And where did you let the kid go? Do you even know? Rita couldn't believe that her husband, who had not lifted a finger lately for the well-being of the family, was now expressing complaints to her, a kind soul who took the boy into her home. She squinted her already narrow eyes and pursed her lips, contemplating how to respond to her husband's dissatisfaction. Tomas, have you gone crazy? You kicked him out of the house, and now you're asking me where I let him go? The woman became even angrier and, hitting the table with her fist, almost shouted, I don't know where he goes. It's Anna's business now. Tomas looked guilty and turned his gaze away. These occasional bursts of righteousness and concern rarely happened to him and, usually, were misplaced. Now he understood that Rita was right. It was ridiculous for him to be worried about someone else's problems in their family situation. He even saw that Rita used Alex's money, but he always kept silent, convincing himself that she knew better. The five-minute silence was broken by Tomasa's last words for the evening. 
He stood up from the table, muttering to no one in particular. Help the kid, damn it. Rita sat in the kitchen for a long time. Her husband was repulsive to her after their heartfelt conversation the day before. She was also disgusted with herself. And this mysterious someone who had miraculously healed her friend didn't leave her mind. And Alex, at such a young age, started earning large sums of money. Alex reconciled with Hernandez. After a successful and very laborious day, they agreed to meet on the last working day of the week, which was Friday. It was a hot July morning. Leonardo and Tomas peacefully slept in their beds. Their plans for the day included going to the movies to watch the latest part of a global blockbuster and taking a walk in the park nearby. Rita and Alex woke up early. The woman prepared a delicious omelet and called the boy who was preparing for his trip. Alex, you know we are worried with Uncle Tomas. You don't even tell us where you're going. Alex understood that this morning wouldn't be pleasant, but the omelet, expertly prepared by Aunt Rita as always, would still be there. At best, half eaten. When the boy was nervous and not in a good mood, he lost his appetite and refused to eat. Aunt Rita, I'm going to work. What, did you earn money for your mom's operation? Rita smirked, tired of Alex's secrets. Yes, that's right. Aunt Rita looked at Alex and shook her head disapprovingly. Alex got up from the table, untouched by the omelet, and said, Thank you, Aunt Rita, it was delicious. He put on his backpack and left, while Aunt Rita seethed with anger and couldn't even understand why she was so bothered by this kid's problems and the mysteries of her friend's child. She instinctively entered the guest room where Alex slept and approached the bed. Rita looked under the pillow, shook the blanket, searching for something she didn't even know. She remembered that she had once allowed Alex to put his things in the nightstand next to the bed. Without hesitation, she leafed through the boy's books and notebooks. Something small fell out of one of them. It was Don Hernandez's business card. Rita read everything written on both sides of it and was about to go to the phone to call Anna, but something stopped her. Still, she later took her phone, not to call her friend. Instead, she photographed her finding and put it inside one of the books. When tired Alex returned from work, Aunt Rita warmly greeted him and invited him to the table. Having dinner with the Ferrer family, he was waiting for the moment when Aunt Rita, who had already annoyed him with her questions, would start another unpleasant conversation. But, to Alex's surprise, it didn't happen. Aunt Rita, I won't be here in the first half of the day. I'm going to a celebration with the guys. The woman smiled and gently replied. Sure, Alex, we'll wait for you for dinner. Now go to bed. Don Hernandez was throwing a big party to celebrate his birthday and invited many bright and successful people to the upcoming event. Even the sparkling band, whom the businessman loved so much, was supposed to come with their hits. Alex couldn't, and didn't want to, refuse the invitation. It was time to take a break from all the problems that burdened his young shoulders and celebrate not only his dear friend's birthday, but also his mother's recovery. He had already visited a bookstore and picked what he considered to be the most interesting and unusual book as a gift for the birthday boy. Alex left for the living room, and Rita was full of emotions and indignation, now mixed with exultation. Finally, she understood the source of the sudden enrichment of the Ortega family. Tomas, let's go sit on the bench in the yard. It feels stuffy to me. Oh, Rita, why sit there? I want to sleep. I found out everything about Alex. She whispered loudly and impatiently to her husband. Why are you shouting here, huh? They went to the yard, somewhere in the distance, the shouts of kids playing around the yards could still be heard, but there was no one else around. Rita told her husband about the business card. Well, what do you say about this? See, I knew it. My fears were confirmed. I told you, Rita, I told you that the boy got into trouble. Did you call Anna? No, why bother her right now? Tomas pondered, and Rita looked at his puzzled eyes, expecting some kind of answer from him. It seemed like her husband was thinking about something, but he didn't dare to voice his thoughts yet. Rita added, I checked the internet, 
found out about him. Seems like some kind of thug. I didn't dig deep, but it seems he's involved in real estate. How old is he? Tomas asked thoughtfully, analyzing the information from his wife. About 60, I think. It's terrible, terrible, Tomas. Look what Anna got us into. Well, well, Tomas calmly said, calm down. He lit a cigarette. How can I not be upset? She'll be back soon, and she'll find out about this jerk. Can you imagine what will happen to us? Tomas was hardly listening to his wife's nervous rambling and only occasionally asked clarifying questions. Is Anna getting discharged on Monday? Yes, Tomas, on Monday. And so? Well, we'll set up the old man. I don't understand. What's not to understand? Do you have a phone? Yes. You'll call and introduce yourself as the mother. Like this, you say, I'll report to the police, I'll expose you in the media. These entrepreneurs are afraid of getting dirty in any scandal. We'll tell them not to bother Alex anymore. And then? Then Anna will come, and that's it. And that's it? And that's it. The boy won't understand why his old man abandoned him. And he'll forget about it later. Well, and the man paused and looked at his wife, then continued, we should make some money off this. Tomas. Rita said in a hushed voice. Well, what, Rita? What did you expect to hear from me? Just be more natural, so he believes that you are his mother, not some Aunt Rita. The conversation between the spouses on the bench in the yard was over. Rita indeed expected such a decision, and of course, she wanted it to be a joint one. She couldn't voice such an outrageous idea herself, so she used Tomas's blunt approach, as he, just like her, if not more, loved to get easy money. They were known among acquaintances as freeloaders. Lying in bed, already accustomed to her husband snoring, and as a result, late falling asleep, Rita, as usual, thought about the events of the past day. She felt guilty, thinking to herself, how did we come to this with Tomas? Rita reassured herself that the decision hadn't been made yet, and no matter what her husband said, she was still in charge in this house. The morning has a wiser view of the evening. With such thoughts, the woman slowly fell asleep. Alex entered the bookstore, forgetting about the most important thing. What kind of gift is it without wrapping, huh? He wanted his friend to see his attitude first and foremost. Although the resentments were behind them, Alex still felt uneasy about the recklessness he had shown to Don Hernandez in the past. He wanted to completely redeem himself in his friend's eyes, and while carefully selecting gift wrapping for the book, he lost track of time. However, it was time to call a taxi now. Anna lay in the hospital bed. Sometimes doctors came in to check on her condition, but it happened less and less often. It was clear she was almost recovered. The two weekends before her discharge were just a formality. After the surgery Anna had undergone, she was supposed to stay under medical supervision for two weeks. Besides, she was strongly drawn back home to Alex. The worry about her son hadn't left her, on the contrary, it was intensified after their last conversation. Although she had promised the Ferrers the day before that she would be discharged by Monday, she was on the verge of packing all her things and requesting an early discharge. You can't deceive a mother's heart, it senses a child's joys and troubles, feels the unspoken words on the child's lips. Anna raised herself from the bed, got up, and started tidying up the bed. She packed her things into a large sports bag and went to the hospital administration. It was just past seven in the evening when Rita was lucky to come home early again. She sat in the armchair, planning to call the businessman. Someone rang the doorbell. Tomas and Leonardo were home. Rita wasn't expecting anyone else. For some reason, this ring startled her and she felt that something was amiss. Approaching the door and peering through the peephole, Rita was horrified to see her friend Anna, whom she didn't expect to see today. For a moment, Rita stood frozen in front of the door, considering the words she would have to say, explaining Alex's absence. But Anna's second ring brought her back to reality. Rita opened the door. Anna, my dear, how glad I am to see you. 
Weren't you feeling well in the hospital, after all? Rita feigned enthusiasm and led her friend into the hallway. They exchanged kisses and went to the kitchen. Come on, let's have some coffee together. I still have some cake from yesterday. Rita said, trying to mask her growing concern about Alex's absence in the living room. Anna asked, worried about Alex's absence. Rita, where's Alex? Alex is at a celebration with his friends. When will he be back? In the evening. He didn't say exactly when. As Rita busied herself with coffee and cake, Anna looked around. She noticed a new imported refrigerator in place of the old one, and the buffet had been replaced with a new one as well. She had never seen a coffee machine at her friend's before. I see you've made some changes to the kitchen? Anna remarked. Are you talking about the new wallpaper? It's just a small thing. Rita replied. Anna looked at the wallpaper. They were indeed new. Non-woven, she noticed. What? I don't even know such a word. Rita said. Anna knew Rita well. She was familiar with that feeling when Rita became nervous. Now she could see how Rita strained to smile at every word, making many unnecessary movements, merely serving tea with cake to her guest. But Rita patiently waited for her son to come home. After an hour, Tomas arrived. Leonardo was playing video games in his room. But Tomas realized that something was wrong with Rita and tried to rattle Anna. Anna, how did the surgery go? Tell me all the details. The clock hands were approaching 10 in the evening. Anna couldn't bear it any longer and turned to the couple. Where is my son? Anna, what's wrong with you? He'll be back soon. Anna took out her mobile and dialed her son's number. She heard only beeps in response. After five minutes, she tried again, but just like the first time, there was no answer. At the birthday party of Salvador Hernandez Carrasco, a well-known and very successful person who had helped numerous aspiring entrepreneurs, it was very noisy. Many people in the business sphere knew him. Although his past was tainted with many unpleasant stories, in recent years Hernandez had become known as one of the most significant benefactors among businessmen. On one side, loud dynamic music played, on the other, the bright, unending laughter of guests was heard, and on the third side, fireworks were being launched in honor of Hernandez's birthday. Alex had no escape from this lively atmosphere of the wealthy life. Although he preferred comfort and quiet and would have chosen reading books over such a lively pastime on a regular day, tonight he was in a particularly festive mood. He had no intention of isolating himself. However, it was uncomfortable at times when guests asked him, Who are you, young man? He got used to answering such questions with, I'm the son of Don Hernandez's colleague. That's how they had agreed with Hernandez. All the worried calls from his mother were successfully missed by the young man. If only he knew what consequences his carelessness could lead to. Yes, Alex could be careless at times. He was, in general, a romantic soul, imagining plots of his favorite books while sitting in class during a boring lesson. Tonight's event also inspired him in its own way. It was reminiscent of a scene from one of the books he had read. Everything he saw around him resembled the description of the party from The Great Gatsby written by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Alex observed the unusual guests, admired their outfits, and listened to their conversations, so different from his own life, but that made it even more intriguing for him. The table was filled with a variety of dishes, some of which Alex had never tasted before. Now he had the opportunity to try something other than the infamous dumplings and his mom's meatballs with pasta. There you are, Alex. Don Hernandez called out to the boy. Your gift was very impressive. I wanted to talk to you. Come, let's find a quieter place. Salvador, Salvador, come here quickly. Amalia has arrived. The man visibly brightened up. Smiling, he said to Alex. We'll talk later. Then he hurried towards the crowd of guests standing by the gates, leaving the boy alone again. Meanwhile, a real scandal erupted in the Ferrer's apartment. 
Anna nervously paced back and forth in the living room, demanding some kind of coherent answer from her husband and wife. Where is my son? Where should I go? You're all lying. Anna looked accusingly at Tomas, who guiltily stared at the floor. Rita made one last attempt to calm her friend down. Anna, calm down. He should be here any minute now. It's 11 o'clock. Enough. Where is Alex? The woman screamed at Rita so loudly that she, frightened, glanced at her husband, who nodded, indicating she could tell the truth. Anna, don't be angry. I only found out the truth today accidentally. His card fell out of a book and there was some man's phone number on it. What? Why didn't you tell me about it earlier? The terrified mother shouted even more fiercely. Where's this card? Give it to me. Rita found the business card. She had just extended it to Anna when she snatched it back quickly and hurriedly left, slamming the door behind her. After all, she came to the Ferrers only to see Alex. Anna realized that she had nowhere to go. She had no idea where to find this uncle, as Rita's friend put it. But she had his phone number. Though, was it really his number? That was a big question. Perhaps, it was the number of his company. She deemed it useless to dial that number. She decided to go home and find out all about this person through the internet on her laptop. She got home, not bothering to take off her shoes or eat, turned on her laptop, and searched for Hernandez's number in the search engine. She spent an hour like that, reading information about him and his business, colleagues, clicking from link to link, from website to website. She read so much unnecessary information and, most importantly, couldn't find what she was looking for, where to find this person. The woman was very nervous. It was getting close to 11 at night. Alex had never come home after 10 before. Desperate, she considered calling the police, but then she stumbled upon one of the conversations in a social network. People were discussing the businessman. In this conversation, Anna finally saw what she had been looking for so long. Someone had written where Hernandez lived. Not just the city, but the elite settlement. Anna saved the name of the settlement in her phone, turned off her laptop and the lights in the apartment, and hastily left, calling a taxi. She arrived there only at midnight. Stepping out of the car, Anna realized that a new, challenging task awaited her, how to find the businessman's house in this elite settlement. It was 12 at night, and the party showed no signs of stopping. Even at such a late hour, expensive foreign cars were still arriving with distinguished guests, and the band Sparkling was performing their romantic songs on stage. There was a lot of joy that night. Perhaps only the neighbors were dissatisfied as the festive noise kept them from sleeping peacefully. Salvador Hernandez was thrilled to see Amalia, his longtime love and business colleague. She was significantly younger than him, but at some point, tender feelings emerged between the two, and a couple of years ago, Amalia became the old businessman's last chance not to spend his whole life alone with the SPHYNX cat and servants. They had warm and affectionate relationships. The couple went on trips to the seaside and spent unforgettable two weeks of happiness there. This idol could have lasted longer if Salvador hadn't proposed to Amalia. She couldn't accept his proposal, something pushed her away. There was a difference between a romantic fling on the Mediterranean coast and marriage. Amalia wasn't bothered by all the rumors surrounding her beloved's personality. She simply enjoyed their life together. However, when the topic of tying her life to this man arose, she seemed to change her attitude towards what had recently filled her with enthusiasm, affection, and even happiness. Instead, worry and fear for her future took over, and public opinion, in the form of her family, played its role. Nevertheless, it was challenging for Amalia to make a decision, especially when it came to telling Hernandez about it. Since she rejected the enamored businessman, he had put an end to his love affairs once and for all and firmly decided, I don't need anyone. Alex and a few other guests stood at the billiard table, taking turns trying to pocket the last three balls. The birthday celebrant approached the players. Alex, can I talk to you? We still haven't had a chance to chat. Sure, Don Hernandez, of course. 
Alex and Hernandez headed towards the porch, where it was a little quieter. There, Salvador had a serious conversation with his friend. Alex, I wanted to say something. You see, probably, I'm not in the best of health. You look great. Oh, thank you, my friend, but I'm sick. I'm very, very sick. Very? Yes, it's like you sing in. You probably don't know, but it surprised me. But I prefer prose. So, how about your health? I need a completely different environment. In general, Alex, I'm leaving soon. Where to? Maybe to Paris. I don't know yet. Alex felt sad. He got used to communicating with Don Hernandez, and the news of his imminent departure noticeably saddened the boy. Hernandez looked at the pensive Alex and tried to cheer him up. Well, don't worry, Alex. I'll invite you and your mom to visit me. The boy considered Hernandez's words a temporary way of consolation. He silently smiled and returned to the billiard table. Don Hernandez lit a cigarette. Meanwhile, the distressed mother tried to find out where the businessman lived. She was walking along the roads of the settlement already in the dark, unable to collect her thoughts. What should she do? She had done everything to find her son, and he was somewhere close by. But she couldn't possibly knock on every house in the settlement. Besides, the people living here were wealthy, which could lead to certain problems. Yes, and overall, under stress, the thought that Hernandez might be somewhere else was spinning more and more in her head. And who said that this business card had anything to do with Alex's disappearance? Ahead, Anna saw an elderly man with a dog coming towards her. He was chatting with his pet and seemed friendly and amiable to her. She greeted him. Good evening. Good evening, Sonora. How can I help you? Yes, I really need to know where businessman Hernandez lives. Please, help me, Anna pleaded to the stranger. The elderly man smiled. What, our virtuous yard made a mess of something. My son is at his place. What? Well, actually, the man fell silent. What? Do you know something about him? Actually, miss, it looks like our Hernandez. Always helping everyone, he's our man. Anyway, I see you're not in the mood for chit-chat. Do you hear the noises? What noises? Celebrations. Go to them. Another hundred meters down this road, then turn left. Anna switched from walking to running, not even having a chance to thank the man with the dog. She wanted to see and take Alex away from this unfamiliar place as soon as possible. Finally, she reached the cherished gates. They were the only thing separating mother and child. Anna buzzed the intercom, but there was no answer. She made a second attempt, and someone finally responded. Sonora, the owner is not expecting anyone else. I came for my son. For whom? What? I can't hear anything. Go home. My son, my Alex, he's there. I'm his mother. Stop shouting, calm down, and go home. Are you drunk or something? But I will call the police. There was no response. Anna looked at her smartphone screen, 1.20 a.m. Maybe she should call the police after all? Alex was so engrossed in the late night entertainment with interesting adults that he hadn't checked his phone for three hours. How could he bury his face in such a small screen when there was such a grand performance all around? Nevertheless, the boy remembered that Aunt Rita could have called or texted. Or maybe even his mom. Alex looked at his phone screen and was astonished. His mother had called him 15 times in those three hours. He felt scared and strange. Since his mother was hospitalized, they hadn't spoken since after 9 p.m. The doctor demanded that Anna follow a strict routine. Something has happened, Alex thought and started dialing his mother's number. Anna had already given up hope, willing to do anything to get inside the mansion's gates. Just a bit more, and she would lose her mind from despair. But someone called. It was her son. With trembling hands, she pressed the answer button. Alex. Alex, where are you? 
Where are they keeping you? Alex? She couldn't make out a word, no matter how hard Alex tried to shout through the various sounds of celebration. It only seemed to Anna that she heard her son's voice, but she wasn't sure. Alex understood it was futile. He hung up and began typing a message to his mother. Suddenly, his phone screen went blank. Oh, no way. The boy cursed desperately. And my phone is dead. Salvador, there's some crazy woman threatening with the police. She was screaming about her son. With these words, one of Hernandez's security guards approached him. Can't be true, Salvador thought. He told me he warned everyone. So, what should we do? Maybe Cruz and Diego should handle this? No, no, are you crazy? Let her in. How do we let her in? Like this. Salvador shouted at his bewildered guard. The man, confused, went to open the gates. When the door opened in front of Anna, she literally rushed onto the mansion's territory, paying no attention to the questions and comments from the guests, frantically searching for her son. Bengal lights were burning all around, people were laughing and cheering. Nearby, someone was still setting off fireworks, and loud music echoed throughout the village. Anna was too weak for such stressful situations, her head was spinning. She found an empty chair and sat down. She wanted to catch her breath for just a minute before continuing her search for Alex. A mustached man with slick back gray hair approached her. You must be Anna Ortega? Alex's mother? It was Don Hernandez. He looked at the woman, at her tired and half-crazed, half-closed eyes, and understood that Alex had hidden the truth from his mother. She knew nothing. It's you, scoundrel. She recognized the man from the internet photos she had been looking at just a few hours ago. You kidnapped Alex. Anna lunged at Don Hernandez, and to her bad luck, the security was far away. She threw the first champagne glass she found at him, and then she managed to scratch his face, drawing blood. Salvador dropped his cane and fell to the ground. She was ready for more, but Hernandez's reliable security reached her just ten seconds after the incident. They took the struggling woman by the arms and started leading her towards the gate. No need. The old man, rising from the ground, shouted. Find Alex. Oleg went to get the boy. Within a minute, the happy mother was embracing her son, and Alex felt embarrassed. Mom, what are you doing here? He asked in surprise. She just hugged him tightly and didn't want to let him go. Anna cried tears of joy, finding the most precious person in her life made her even happier than the day he was born. The incident did not in the slightest mar the end of the celebration for the businessman's birthday. By the time the panicked stranger had barged into the party, most of the guests were so drunk that the woman's behavior seemed amusing to them. Some even thought that it was a prank organized for Hernandez's amusement. In any case, by the next morning, almost no one remembered the incident. The only one in a gloomy mood was Hernandez himself. Here's your birthday for you. Standing on the porch with a cigarette, he shared his sorrow with the gardener Luca. At home, Alex was awaiting a serious conversation with his mother, but she was very tired after such a distressing nighttime adventure, which fortunately ended well. So they agreed to postpone their discussion until morning. The woman woke up only at noon, suffering from a headache. On her way to the kitchen, she checked on Alex. To her surprise, he was still asleep. Alex was a typical early riser and didn't like lying in bed for too long. Did they get him drunk there? Anna thought, feeling irritated. She went to the kitchen and took a headache pill. Hoping that her son would wake up soon, she started preparing breakfast for the two of them, just as it used to be in their carefree and tranquil life before her illness. It's all my fault with my illness. If it weren't for me. She thought, stirring the oatmeal in the pot. She would have kept dwelling on it and trying to figure out what her son had gotten into, but she heard a timid, slow creak of the door. Alex finally got out of bed. They sat in silence. In silence, they began their breakfast, not even wishing each other a good appetite. 
The kitchen was enveloped in the same heavy silence that usually precedes long and unpleasant conversations. Anna noticed that Alex wanted to take an egg without eating half of the porridge. Why didn't you finish your breakfast? I ate a lot yesterday, Mom. I'm not hungry. Ate and drank, apparently. Did that old man get you drunk yesterday? Mom, drop it. No, we're just opening this topic, she continued with a sarcastic smile. Who is this scoundrel, and what does he want from you? He's not a scoundrel, he's my friend. Throughout this time, Alex tried not to lose his composure. As unpleasant and uncomfortable as it was to answer his mother's degrading questions, she accused the person who saved her life of all sins. Friend? Friend, Alex, are you talking about Vico? About Tim? About that nasty old man? And why is he so attached to you? What does he want from you? I knew you wouldn't understand. You're just like Aunt Rita. You don't believe in anything good. But Anna ignored all of her son's retorts and objections. She remained firm in her decision. I want you to know I'm going to report him to the police. Alex couldn't hold it any longer. Getting up from the table, he hit the table with his fist. He saved your life. The boy put on his shoes in the hallway and was about to leave without a word, but on the previous night, when they were returning home in a taxi, he saw her tired, exhausted eyes. Now he realized that she was still weak and it was not worth upsetting her. He coldly said to her before leaving, I'm not going to Don and Andes's, don't worry. I'm going for a walk with Vico. I'll be back later. I feel disgusted being here. Anna sat in the kitchen. The news she heard from her son didn't really please her. On the contrary, her negative attitude towards the old businessman only grew stronger in her mind. So, you decided to get my son attached to you, such a thought appeared in her head. She decided that she must visit the country house again, where Alex had been and have a serious talk with its owner. The conversation with the Ferrers was brief. She went to their house in the evening and found only her former friend, Rita, looking depressed. So, that's what you were fussing about near the hospice? Trying to improve your family's financial situation, huh? Anna looked at her former friend with disdainful contempt. Anna, what are you saying? You know, I talked to Alex, got the truth out of him. He told me that you never kept him. I think he still hasn't told me everything. Anna, let's sit down. I'll pour some coffee. You'll calm down. No, Rita, we won't have coffee now. We'll never have it again. Forget about our home and my number. Anna decided firmly. Anna left Rita's apartment, a place that was once so familiar and beloved. For many years, she had sought comfort and understanding here, finding it in the company of her old friend. How many tears had she shed here? How much of her soul had she poured out? Now, she felt sad to permanently close this door. A few days later, Alex shocked his mother with another intention to go to Don Hernandez. There was a huge scandal in the family, and no matter what the boy tried to say in defense of his friend, Anna, as always, ignored his words, unwilling to see any positive side of this strange friendship. Nevertheless, Alex packed his backpack and left. Mom, I'm begging you, don't go there. I'll be back soon, I need to apologize. Anna was in slight confusion, he's going to apologize for me to that old monster? How is this possible? Her desire to visit Hernandez only grew stronger after the day of the argument with her son. Two whole weeks had passed since Alex's last visit to Don Hernandez. Life for the Ortega family returned to its usual routine. After many years, the father visited his wife and son. The three of them decided not to stay at home in the hot sunny weather and went to the amusement park. They had a lot of laughter and fun that day. People passing by wouldn't believe that the husband and wife were divorced. They looked so harmonious together. The former complete family briefly became one again. No one was resentful anymore. Each got what they wanted. Alex was pleased to see his parents together, even though he understood that such a beautiful atmosphere was created by his parents, primarily for him. 
Anna had almost forgotten about her son's suspicious acquaintance with the businessman with a dark past. Of course, she no longer intended to go to him with threats. She was now preoccupied with important matters. She was looking for a decent job for herself. Almost every day, Anna went to interviews, sent emails to companies, and made phone calls. Meanwhile, Alex played with his friends in the yard, read his favorite books, and occasionally sat at the computer, playing an online game with Vico and Tim. Yet, this day had come. Alex was once again planning to visit Don Hernandez. In his heart, he hoped that his mother had cooled off about his trips out of town. Yes, and furthermore, he understood that this would be his last trip to the settlement. Anna let Alex go, but on the same day, she decided to go to the countryside to see Hernandez. She entered her son's room, sat on his bed. There was a new book with a beautiful hardcover on the nightstand. It was Three Men in a Boat, To Say Nothing of the Dog, by Jerome K. Jerome. Although she wasn't as much of a reader as Alex, she knew about this work. Anna opened the book. The title page was filled with writing in black gel pen. She read, Throw away this junk, old man. Let your lifeboat be light. Take into it only the most necessary, a cozy home and modest joys, the one who loves you and is dearer to you than anyone else. Two or three friends worthy of the name, a cat and a dog, plenty of food and clothing, and a bit more than enough to drink because thirst is a terrible thing. And then you will see that your lifeboat will sail easier without the danger of capsizing. And if it does capsize, it's not a big deal. A simple, solid cargo won't be afraid of the water. You will have enough time for contemplation, for work, and to enjoy the sunny light of life and to listen, holding your breath, to the music that the divine breeze extracts from the strings of the human heart. My dear friend Alex, do you remember I asked you if you had read this wonderful work? I know that you haven't. You must read this book, which I am wholeheartedly giving to you, and joining the author's words, I will give you a friendly piece of advice. Never dwell on trivial things. Cherish what is most important to you, your beautiful mother, your friends, your love for books. And, of course, never forget to dream. Don't lose heart. I, too, am sorry to bid farewell to such a good friend. I will wait for you to grow up so that we can finally have a good whiskey somewhere in a nice Parisian bar and discuss our affairs and plans. But for now, don't let your mother down and be honest with her, never deceive her. Believe an old man, lies have never led to anything good. Let's end on a positive note, my friend. I am very glad for this wonderful acquaintance in my old age. Thank you for everything. Anna reread Don Hernandez's text several times. Although she still had unpleasant memories of Hernandez, she now understood that this person was not a threat to her son. Moreover, he seemed unaware of Alex's activities he kept hidden from her. Anna decided not to go anywhere. She put the kettle on and began to enjoy the peace and solitude. She learned that the old man was leaving, going far away, and there was nothing to fear or worry about for Alex. However, she didn't want to entertain the thought that her son had made a good acquaintance. The prejudices firmly rooted in the mind of the 42-year-old woman and mother were stronger than all the facts indicating that Hernandez was, in fact, a decent person. Alex arrived on time. Uncle Luca was helping people accompanying Don Hernandez to load everything into the trunk of a large SUV. Hernandez himself was sitting on the porch, smoking a cigar. An open book about event management lay on the coffee table next to a glass of red wine. He decided to mark his departure to France in such a modest way, which was not unfamiliar to him. From a distance, he saw the familiar boy. Well, hello. You came to see me off after all? Hernandez addressed him with the same friendly smile as during their first meeting. Good day, Don Hernandez. Of course, I came. How could it be otherwise? I wanted to see you off on a good path. The end of August pleased with warm sunlight. Leaves had already turned yellow in some places, and the air was filled with the scent of apples and the dampness of rains. This weather brought joy to the man, yet at the same time, he felt melancholy. Autumn is coming. Everything around seemed to say. 
Summer had passed, along with the interesting meetings with Alex and evenings with Uncle Luca over wine. Now everything would be different. Far from the three-story mansion that had become so familiar to him with its view of the coniferous forest. Ah, Alex, loneliness is painful. It feels like I've been lonely all my life. I've chopped so much wood in my life, and now I'm alone. And what am I doing now? I'm going abroad. But why? Perhaps, for your well-being? Alex said uncertainly. No, not for my well-being. That's already almost gone. I lived in the capital at first, then decided to move to the countryside. I've been here for three years and realized that I'm not doing well. Not doing well? Yes, this time I decided to go far away. But you know, Hernandez made a short pause and looked up at the clear blue August sky. You can't run away from yourself. Do you need to? The boy asked. Hernandez sadly smiled and looked into Alex's eyes. Kid, you're so clever, huh? At your age. Of course, you don't need to run away. But you, write me. You. The boy saw that Don Hernandez grew even sadder. Stay. Stay in any way, don't disappear. When Alex left for the gate, Don Hernandez watched him until he disappeared among the autumn trees. I used to be just like Alex once. I loved life so much and walked through it with a smile and positivity. I believed in the best, dreamed of great things. What happens to all of us? And why? It seemed strange to Hernandez, but in the boy, he saw, quite literally, himself. That's why he enjoyed talking to Alex so much. It was as if he was transported back to the best years of his life when it seemed like a whole adult, exciting, and eventful life lay ahead. But something went wrong, and without realizing it, the young naive guy, Salvador Hernandez, plunged into a world of crime, debauchery, and the pain caused to people, both strangers and loved ones. He could never erase this time from his tortured soul. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.